What's up? What's up, my fellow fishermen and automotive enthusiasts? <laughs> I do want to include, um, since my kind of YouTube channel is kind of morphed from fishing, just fishing, to more like all my other hobbies. And you never know if I might just start streaming some of my games um, through YouTube as well, too. And, you know, I kind of want to get back and uh, playing some of the games I like to play. One of my favorite was Battlefield Bad Company, too. Uh, but besides the point, um, I kind of want to talk about muskie today. Um, I was joking around with my dad. You know, one of my, at one point in my 20s, I was like, after I got a few cars, a few other toys underneath my belt, I was thinking about buying property um, out in upper rural Michigan, maybe even constructing my own pond. I'm like, how cool would that be? Um, a lot of YouTubers, I, I don't know a lot, but... There's a few YouTubers, their whole channel's about basically constructing a pond, you know, making structure, stocking it with all types of different species of fish they like to target, whether it's largemouth bass, you know, pike, whatever, and stock it with their own favorite forage. Um, I think there's, there's like a really, there's a billionaire or something down in Texas. I think he did that, um, like, stocked. <clears throat> what he did is he had like one or two major ponds and he had all these two or three or four different separate ponds attached and he had the smaller ponds stocked with these you know prawns that supposedly in his theory would make the big basically the biggest largemouth bass by stocking it with these prawns you know it would basically genetically influence these largemouth bass and becoming you know record fish because I guess Texas is just they're obsessed with bass fishing. They're obsessed with growing like really big large one bass and they'll do anything they can to like reclaim that title um, of the biggest large one bass. I think it's tied, was it George Perry's bass is tied with um, that one dude from Japan and you know, <laughs> I guess Texas is still trying to take that title over. Um, let's see if I can pronounce his name right. Manabu Karita, uh, but he has basically, you know, it's tied with, I think, um, George Perry's bass, but I was thinking, I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if you could actually stock a pond with tiger muskie? You know, it'd be very hard to do. There's like two species in freshwater you really hard to do would be smallmouth bass and spotted muskie or even barred muskie. Um, because, you know, they need colder temperatures. I suspect if you did make a deep enough pond that they could possibly thrive there. But then again, I'm like, I just, I haven't come across any ponds in Michigan that have uh, smallmouth bass that have survived or even, um, you know, spotted muskie. So, but I think tiger muskie would be capable of thriving in basically a standard shallow pond, nothing too be deep, like 10 feet deep, and they'd be able to thrive in it, you know. I mean, those things probably would be able to eat any type of forage you throw at them. And, you know, they tend to be stunted for the most part compared to regular Great Lakes muskie or barred muskie. But, I mean, with the right minerals um, and the right, I think, uh, ecosystem and forage that... You know, there's certain lakes, I think, out in Washington um, where muskie normally aren't found. They started stocking tiger muskie out there. You know, well, the state, you know, not the District of Columbia, all the way on the um, west side of the country, next to California, they stocked them and they got 50 inch tiger muskie there now, just gigantic. So I think it takes some time to increase their size and for the most part they can be stunted but it would be pretty cool to just like own some property in michigan figure out a way to stock it with tiger muskie see if you could get them to survive and do it that way too i don't gotta deal with any trolls i can film anytime i want to my own pond catch as many fish as i want to all that uh, but I think, what was it? It was, what's his name? He still got stalked by trolls and the DNR was, uh, I think it was one Rod Run really. I can't remember what he did, but he had his own pond and stocked it or did something illegal and the trolls called at him. And I'm like, 
that's kind of interesting. So there is still, you know, you still got to follow by the rules um, and the legalities, um, you know, whatever the season may be. I, I don't know what he did wrong, but it just, it would be kind of cool to stock a pond with Tiger Muskie. You know, I don't think everyone, anyone's ever tried that before. And honestly, for the most part, most fishermen just aren't into musky fishing in general. So why would they even think about doing tiger musky? And, you know, Esox in general are known to just take over ponds. Um, I, oh, I want to bring my, um, I got a story about this. Hold on, let me go get it real quick. But anyways, um, so here it is, um, uh, where we caught this Northern Pike, um, me and the Greek Uber, my brother, is a pond kind of it's up in the upper part of anchor bay and the stream is somehow connected all the way to lake st Clair, and this pond is relatively deep and it actually has like two or three springs in it but kind of interesting i'm not going to name the city because someone might know but it is kind of unique um my buddy the great grouper you know his dad had a lot of friends um i think in waste management um the place where he, the pond, there's also, you know, he kept a lot of the garbage to, 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 like, behind it. But then, like, you know, dug a really deep section out for this pond. And it ended up having, I think, two to three different springs. And what do you know, um, the pond actually has a stream, I think, somehow connects all the way to Anchor Bay and Lake St. Clair, I think, somehow. And the stream is just... um. It's basically, uh, I think, connects to one of the canals or somehow. Kind of like, it's kind of similar to how, like, Black Creek is at Metro Park. But just a really long stream. But anyways, the 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 pond was basically just stocked with largemouth bass, panfish. Um, and I think it even has perch in it, <laughs> believe it or not. It's that deep. But somehow, pike made its way in there. But there's a, again, there's a stream connect connected all the way somehow to Anchor Bay and um I suspect I you know I I'm not 100% sure but anyways the Esox the Northern Pike somehow made its way in there and and then the pike basically almost took over the pond and there's a point where you know there's some things um we started keeping a lot of pike and then we eventually found out how, you know, basically to balance the species off. And then, you know, we went back there, I think, I want to say almost 10 years and went back to that area and fished the pond and we were catching nothing but largemouth bass. And before that, it was just all northern pike. So that was kind of rather interesting how it just, you know, things can fluctuate, you know, at times, <clears throat> even at a pond, you know, things can fluctuate, things can change, but, um, you know, most fishermen wouldn't want to stock their pond with Esox, Northern Pike, Tiger Muskie, or even trying to do, you know, uh, Barred Muskie or Spotted Muskie. I've heard the Barred Muskie, they're a very aggressive species. I think the DNR at one point decided to stock Orchard Lake with some Barred Muskie, and that's like one of the areas in the southeastern region of Michigan where you actually can go to that in the lake and actually try to get yourself a barred lake or barred muskie because most of the muskie you catch at Lake St. Clair they're spotted you know the typical Great Lakes muskie and I guess the barred muskie they're just a little more aggressive or a lot more aggressive I don't you know I just heard they're they're more aggressive and it can at times give you a, a better fight um, pound for pound compared to the regular spotted Okay, so before exiting this topic, I do want to cover um, what would be your guys' favorite structure? What type of weeds, ecosystem, forage would you like to do if you were set out to basically stock a pond full of tiger muskie? Um, I mean, it's just such an interesting topic for me. I got sidetracked with the other topics talking about, you know, what they did with the bass pond, bass pond down in Texas, but... What would you do with, you know, a tiger muskie pond? Um, would you just stock it with the standard bluegill, sunfish? Um, would you go about just 
stocking it with catfish. What if what would happen if you stock? It's such a fun topic. Think about it. If you stocked tiger musky and just a shitload of catfish, how big those fucking tiger musky would get, man? Or even maybe you know the most common one is suckers. Um, I don't know how well suckers thrive in um a pond i think they're more of a river and you know bigger bigger water big lake type of fish but i think catfish and tiger muskie for me i just would like to see the outcome that's what i would go with carp i know they like to feed on carp but they kind of have a really strong armor on the surroundings those scales um i do think muskie feed on carp from time to time in lake st Clair, but i think I don't think they like those hard flesh fish with the thicker scales on their back. I think the catfish that is more soft flesh, f soft flesh fish, um, like the sheep's head, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 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 suckers they like too. You could do sheep's head also, I was thinking. I've heard they like the soft flesh fish of sheep's head. That's why I guess the bonny bait kind of has that curved head. John Bonnie always talks about on his largest vertical jig fishing. Um, but I just, I, I have a feeling like catfish, tiger muskie, and then I'd probably go with those typical cabbage weeds. weeds. Um, I might, I don't know, you know, you would have to create some type of structure that catfish would thrive in. And then, you know, I maybe, of course, you know, the tiger muskie would like to hang out in the cabbage beach, but I'd have to figure out what structure catfish like down logs you know i know you know since they uh, hand fish from down south they find them in all types of structure down there with logs and stuff down trees i'm sure that would be the go ahead um but hmm, what else was there structure weeds forage i mean a lot of people always end up sucking you know with bluegill and selfish but anyways let me know what you guys think it's fun to think about this stuff because it just down the line, never know, might think about owning some property up north, think about doing that, and that would be super cool, man. Um, I don't even know what the legality is. I'm sure you could do it, you know, um, but you just never know if there is some rules with muskie since they're a rare species. But tiger muskie, since they're stocking them down in a lot of the uh, southern states, even Kentucky, um, they have like some rivers that, you know, musky are thriving in and I think tiger musky as well. So kind of interesting. I think that's one musky species that could survive and thrive in a pond. Um, I think it's possible you could get barred musky to thrive or even spotted, but if you make the right depth and keep those temperatures cold, but I just... I've never heard of a standard muskie doing too well in a pond, but it's really fun to think about. So, um, I did want to talk about kind of like getting into the longevity of muskie fishing, especially casting. Um, there's a lot of fishermen when they start getting into the forties, fifties, especially sixties and seventies, if they want to still muskie fish, they end up just trolling. And to me, it's like, as I showed you guys, you guys, people, even on these musky Facebook groups, they just stick to like bucktails and bulldogs, and they think that's just basically all you need to throw for musky. And the one dude was saying how he, you know, was bass fishing the same lake or whatever, and he caught one, a musky on a fluke, and then lost it. I told him, well, you know, instead of just keep throwing the same old, same old bulldogs and uh, bucktails, Try making a big fluke. I mean, you know, there, there's everything, all the gear you can buy to, you know, basically construct your own soft plastic lure, um, basically on, on uh, the internet. They got all the different soft plastic materials, um, the, the molds, you can make your own mold. I mean, there's all types of different ways. You just don't have to result to always just doing what everyone else did. And I've shown in my YouTube channel, you can use some of the lighter and smaller errors, whether it's the striking 8.0 on um, my old channel. It was one year, Muskie and Pike were going apeshit for two baits, bass fishing. So I decided one day, I went on Canyon Plastics. 
Um, it bought like a seven inch tube, started throwing that next day ended up getting like a 37 inch musky. So it just, each year it fluctuates, whatever forage the musky are feeding on. They're very picky. I don't know if that's the word for it. it just, I think whatever they're targeting, whatever that they're really attracted to the year of, that's what they're going for, man. And it's not always, you know, for me last year over at the spillway, Strike King 8.0 killed it. I'd never seen, well, I think when I say one year, I did get a two musky back to back on bucktails or musky were every year were that year. But another alert where I caught musky back to back, like cast, one cast, I got a musky. Then the next cast, I get a musky. I mean, the Strike King 8.0 was on that year. But this year, not so much. And I find that I got a lot more smallmouth bass with that lure. So I've been changing up, trying to figure out last time I was out, got to follow up with the Chaos Poseidon. So it just, each year it fluctuates. And getting to what I was getting at is just, you don't always have to throw these heavy ass lures. You get in your older years, you can still, you know, throw these lighter lures. And I've showed that. And I think chatterbaits are still kind of making their way um they're just they're not that popular with musky fishermen yet um i think there's one company that makes that ang angry dragon try chatterbait and i haven't got around to um um buying any of their chatterbaits yet basically because there's no local stores that carry these in fact there's no local store that carries a musky chatterbait i mean you can still throw like a one ounce Project Z, but the hook's just so small on it. But that's another lighter lure you could throw in. I've been seeing some videos on um, on uh, YouTube of fishermen picking up some really big musky on cheddar baits. I guess it's TNA Tackle that makes the um, Angry Dragon cheddar baits. And they got some wicked, wicked cheddar baits, man. I mean, just they almost look. They basically used, you know, tinsel, bucktail, some of the same stuff they use for, you know, inline spinners, bladed baits, um, bucktail spinners, whatever you want to call it. Um, the double eights and double tens, they use the same material for a chatterbait. And some of these, actually, they put a uh, soft plastic, like, 8-inch grub, 10-inch grub behind them, too. It's just the designs they got are pretty sweet. But those still haven't become popular. I still don't see people mentioning it much on the Facebook groups, the musky forums, which is really not that popular as they once were. But again, you know, you can, you don't always have to throw bulldogs. Um, I think I do have this, do you have a theory why bulldogs work so well on musky? You know, when I went down to Florida, I tried all types of lures on these saltwater species of fish, especially trying to target the snook. I tried throwing one of those flare hawk jigs, had a monster snook fall me up, but I couldn't get him to bite until I started throwing a jerk bait, trying to get those reaction style bites. And then when I started working that jerk bait like crazy, that's when the snook started responding and I was getting one after one. I think I caught almost 20 snook that day over near the pilings there at Naples beach. Um, but, in a way, the bulldog is very similar to jerkbait. You're constantly ripping. It's a ripping motion. And what musky, Esox in general, whether it's pike or musky, they're just attracted to that, you know, something that's going to be jerked, uh, just worked very aggressively, ripped. You know, some people just call them a slash bait too, you know, with the jerk baits. But I think... <clears throat> glide baits, jerk baits, and bulldogs, it just three of those can be a very effective lure and musky. But do you always have to throw the pounders? I mean, again, you can try like you know that SXR14 or XR14. I as soon as I get a nice bait caster set up, I'm gonna start start doing that. Um I just with a jerk bait though, I just I don't know how big I should go. I think I'm gonna probably get a tackle industries nine footer um with a pro dial pro rex of, of 400 you know with the you know uh, 43 inches per crank and just see how that fits i don't want to go big too big don't want to go too short because you get so many follow-ups that he's musky that you still want to do 
be able to do a figure eight, even with a bulldog or glide bait or any of that stuff. And even though that rod I have now, um, for spinning, it's nine foot, but a lot of the length is all the way back in the rear grip. And I, you saw when I followed, you know, that muskie followed up, it just it got close to the trolling motor. I just didn't get much reach, but it's just the bait caster setups are just so much easier to, you know, be able to do the figure eight or a giant circle, you know, on the musky follow up. And eventually, I mean, yeah, I, I was, I do, I already had the money, but I'm kind of saving up for a car uh, that, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm probably going to pick up two or three Daiwa Pro Rexes and pair them up with a pounder rod, um, a rod for bucktails, and, and basically a probably a rod for a glide bait or a jerk bait or something so and that'll probably be in the middle there um of you know of the action because you know pounder rod you're going with basically the heaviest rod you can get in that tackle industries rod and it's like xx h or whatever you know <clears throat> super heavy so um but I'm kind of excited about that. I'm just looking to really expand um, the tackle I'm using, the gear, everything, the muskie. Finally, I got some mo more money coming in. Um, and just hopefully try to start targeting bigger muskie in deeper water, um, but just bigger muskie in general. Um, I think, you know, at the time, you know, I just... I did like going to just my favorite spots for bass fishing for muskie. Um, and it just, best way to target muskie on most lakes, I would say, is just in front of mouths of rivers, mouths of canals. Even when fall comes around, there's a lot of locals will target muskie in front of the mouths of the canals. And you can get a 50 inch or that way. Like uh, Robbie and Lee from today's angler showed, I think they got like a 50 inch right in front of Miller's Marina. Um, it just, they love the muskie. They like a little bit of current, but they like, I think, following, you know, the smaller bait fish that like a little current and a lot of other species of fish that hang out around the mouths of the rivers, all that. So, um, it just, it is a long learning process, um, the target muskie. I think a lot of fishermen too, they get burned out really easy, get overwhelmed, you know, start learning. It can be a fish of 10,000 casts, especially if you're trying to target them out on the main lake like I did. But if you go near the mouth of the river, mouth of, you know, Detroit River, over near the Sturgeon Hole, mouth of the um, Clinton River Spillway, or even the Thames, it can increase your odds tremendously. And um, <clears throat> what else? Uh, kind of want to start getting to, you know, talking about you only always have to throw bigger lures, lighter lures, but I did want to say, um, you know, using, well, everyone talks about, you know, lightening up their gear they can use, um, basically buying the best gear so it can basically make it a lot easier to throw pounders. Um, basically of course using a bait caster setup but i mean like using the bass you know they got like that predator rod um using like the tranks 500 it just getting the right gear can making growth throws pounders a lot easier uh, being able to load up on the rod they call it getting the right rod so that makes it easier it doesn't put much strain on your shoulders your your joints as such as your elbows even your lower back but a lot of these fishermen don't talk about there is some things you can do um supplemental wise that you know after you get out there like a day of throwing pounders your back is fucked up still even if you're using the best gear especially you do it eight to tw eight to twelve hours i don't care what gear you use you're still gonna be sore especially if you're you know getting in your 40s and 50s and you're not 30 or 20 years old anymore the one thing you could get i highly recommend is investing into some type of quality cbd oil basically hemp oil um there's all types of different names for it um i just call it cbd oil um you can basically the brand i use i go to better health it's called charlotte's web 
Um, it was made by the Stanley Brothers. They're the ones who originally created the original Charlotte's Web based from, I think, cannabis. And they were using this for this girl that had, um, oh, what should I call it, seizures, epilepsy, and all that stuff. It ended up really helping treat their disease. Not actually, you know, cure it, cure it but for the most part, it kind of did if she, you know, kept taking it. Uh, but they found out, you know, when CBD became a really popular product, people were just putting in that main cannab cannabinoid CBD and thinking, oh, well, that's all you need. And that's, you know, it's going to work out the best for treatment. You have to have all types of different cannabinoids, whatever hemp you're using, whatever CBD oil. Um, so like, you know, CBD, CBDA, there's like CBDC, there's all types of cannabinoids, plus the terpenes which is like some other, I think, um, you know, chemical or element from the plant. And just, you have all those can cannabinoids together plus the terpenes. You get a synergistic effect um, for the hemp oil. And that way when you take it, you should feel immediate response. And another thing people forget when taking this, do three to four drops, I recommend underneath your tongue. Hold it for, I would say, 10 to 15 seconds, maybe even longer if you want. Increases the absorption rate, the bioavailability. Um, and it just, I'm telling you, I mean, like, I swear to God, this works better than any ibuprofen I've ever taken, any type of aspirin. Um, aspirin really sucks, but I mean, it just, there's, you know, everyone knows there's a big opioid epidemic right now. And one of the reasons is <laughs> the FDA basically didn't you know they basically you know breaking it down it just there's a lot of lobbying going on from big pharma and they lied about it i think everyone if you want it i don't even need to break down just watch that movie crisis um with uh what's that dude's name uh gary oldman and you get a simple breakdown of what happened how it's lobbying corrupt in our universities lied about the studies lied that you know wasn't addictive and they're completely safe and Oh man, comparing that to some of the stuff that's going on, how like Joe Rogan recommended, you know, that drug, and I didn't don't want to get into that, but it just amazes me how they approve that, but don't approve alternative treatments for for the current virus we're in. But I made a video about that be, uh, before, and you know, basically, I was warned on YouTube, you keep making medical videos like this, we're gonna strike you, and so I'm not gonna get into that, but. I can, however, recommend this for musky treatment, and I, or, you know, musky treatment. Um, any type of inflammation, joint pain from, you know, casting for muskies a long period of time. And I swear to God, this stuff works. Um, maybe, I mean, some people I've heard say they've had di different experience. So it's just sometimes everybody's body's different. But for me, you know, the Char Charlotte's Web brand from Stanley Brothers worked really well. Now, I've heard, you know, there's still drug testing for a lot of jobs. This is actually legal, has the legal amount of THC, which is minimal. Um, it's the legal version, so it's not, you know, it's actually just hemp oil. It's not uh, cannabis. But I've heard if you do spike it with a little bit of uh, uh, cannabis oil or just buy a CBO oil that has a little more, that that even adds to even more synergistic effect. But last thing I think you need, you can use this, like I said, you can actually use this out on the boat if you're going through a little bit of back pain or whatever. Um, you know, you don't wanna get high on the boat. So I still think this is the best thing to use. This is what I recommend. Um, and getting past that, you know, a lot of, another thing people, you know, when you're, at your job, whatever traditional job you're um, working at, whatever field, whether it's um, on the skilled labor industry, something you're on your feet all day. Um, I don't think, you know, if you work in construction, getting something such as a zoo call shoe, what I'm about to tell you guys here, probably would be the best, but, but there is a lot of different jobs where you're standing and you're on your feet all day that these can work, really work. The other shoe I highly re recommend, um, is um what you call it is a uh, uh, Skechers man. They came out with these new glide steps. 
and they try, you know, they try that out, put the job I'm working at, or I try that out, put the job I'm working at, they had, they're made out of mesh, not leather. So I had to basically ditch them for these. And I'm actually glad I am, I, glad I did. I mean, the, those glide steps, you know, they had these like little air pox, pockets in the heel, still very comfortable. Uh, but that's something I could probably still get musky fishing um, if I want to. Um, I am taking them back, but I still think I would say the Z Coles are the most comfortable shoe I've ever worn, and then it would be like those Skechers glide steps. But getting into musky fishing, especially if you're shoreline fishing over at Metro Park, what I like doing in the fall, um, you're all over the park, walking all over, and then after that, you find a spot where they're biting. You're gonna be staying there for like two or three or four hours straight, maybe even longer, casting whatever lure you're using. Even if you're using the 8.0, I'm telling you, by hit that third or fourth hour, you're starting to feel that lower back pain as the gravity is starting to pull down on you. Um, something like this can co come in handy, man. Um, when I was just wearing regular tennis shoes at my workplace, I just I swear to God, after five days of work, I was like, I am not getting out musky fishing this weekend after wearing these a whole week i'm like damn i'm ready to hit musky up fishing like three days in a row two days in a row i just i'm ready to get out there and i was actually this time around i was thinking about hitting it up as soon as i get off work and then friday and also saturday which are my days off and do three days in a row i mean it really makes a difference whether you wearing these at your workplace or at um or wearing a musky. I mean, you're walking around with these musky fishing. People are what the fuck are you wearing? But what's more important, you know, looking, you know, looking long term for pain and relief and all that stuff, or just dealing with people just, you know, making some snob comments here or there. And I actually, I actually don't mind it. And some people know the shoe really well. Some people don't know. I mean, it's, it's weird. I remember. 10 years ago, people really into these, but then they, they kind of just fell off. I think there's only one or two stores in the southeastern Michigan. I actually got these off eBay for 150 and normally they're like 250 You go to the local store and they're not cheap. Um, the, the coil on these can snap. I had it happen once at the job, but you just basically bring a pair of like backup Skechers shoes in case that happens. Um, and you know, they got replacement coils you can buy too, but I swear by these Z coils, man. Um, they still look pretty cool, but again, from the side, you can see that coil and it, you kind of look like inspector gadget, whatever you're doing on the job or, um, or, uh, musky fishing, bouncing around like Tigger, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I'm telling you, they really help relief, of course, and, uh, was it plantar flightus or, uh, heel spurs heel pain um and just i'm telling your lower back and upper back will thank you for it too and like i said other than that i re would recommend sketchers whether it glide step or i think they have the other ones is just called max cushion there's a lot of different sketchers really blown up they got so many different outlets now they got it over in the great lakes mall next to bass pro they got one out there but they got like little outlets everywhere you look their own little uh, tennis shoe shop. So it's really grown how just, and they use, of course, um, what's that stuff called? Uh, just slipped my mind, that, that special cushion material. Memory foam. <laughs> oh man, just couldn't think of it. But anyways, memory foam. They got, you know, especially memory foam inside the sneakers that really add to it you can buy those separate for any tennis shoe you want but i still think ten, uh, sketchers whatever they do with them you know the way they make um you know the the, the heels um again you know with the, those new glide steps they put like little air pockets in there to add to it i actually haven't even tried but you could probably put memory foam in these sketcher or i mean i'm sorry the um z calls but you really don't need to man it already feels like you're walking on a cloud. You're literally, you know, Skechers say you're walking on a cloud with the z coals. You're literally walking on a cloud, man. You'll be casting for musky on a cloud, too, if you're wearing these. I'm actually thinking about, you know, I'll be wearing my Skechers out this fall, walking around the Metro. But I just, like, I think about uh, buying a pair for musky fishing. Now, wearing these out of the boat when Lake St. Clair's real rough. 
you bounce around and end up a fucking overboard and no one to get you if you're fishing alone. So I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. Um, calm days, no problem. But Lake St. Clair, oh man, you'd be bouncing around maybe too much. I think though, they feel weird at first. Like three days, it's like rollerblading for the first time. You feel like you're walking on high hills though. After like fourth or fifth day, you're getting used to it. Second, third, fourth week, it's just like you feel like you're walking in a regular, regular tennis shoe. It's just like, again, you're walking on a cloud. Um, I highly recommend them. Again, I don't know why they're really falling off. There's, I was talking to a few people in different departments at my work. And they're like, oh, yeah, I got to get injections in my heels. I'm like, well, you know these exist, right? And the whole point of them is to prevent heel spurs. And I'm like, some people, I mean, some people are just not into them. And I get that. But I'm like, to me... I'm all about not having to get surgery. That's, again, whatever you can do to prevent any type of joint pain, surgery, whatever it may be, whether it be you using supplements or some type of equipment you can wear, you know. I mean, maybe one day they'll have these uh, exoskeletons like the movie Edge of Tomorrow, Tom Cruise. You'll be out there casting for musky 16 hours straight in an exoskeleton. <laughs> No, I'm just saying, I mean, like, you just don't know how technology is going to really change everything. I mean, it's just one day think about that. Um, You know, I it's funny because I kind of, when these new uh, fish finders came out, you know, they've been really advertising them on Facebook lately with the um, scope. What's it called again? I'll look it up, bro. That's another thing I forgot. Live Pan Optics Live Scope. And I've heard, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, the other fish fighter company, not Garmin, the opposite one. Hummingbird, they're going to be coming out with their own version of it. And it's just like this stuff, technology is really changing that. And at first, I'm like, this should be outlawed for tournament fishing. But then I seen someone comment down below like, yeah, but, you know, it's just like it's all about being a free market. And, you know, I think that company should be allowed to still sell products like this. But, again, for tournament fishing, I guess, you know, leave it up to the pros and whatever they think. But I just, and because they'll all be able to use it, you know, is it going to really give one person the edge over the other that much? I, I don't know. If they can be able to figure out how to use the technology better than the other person like Van Damme, maybe. But it just, it's really, it's really complex. Um, I, I honestly think they really should rethink using live scope for tournament fishing. If it makes it become just, you know, it, it just changes the tactics, everything, the way of looking at, or, you know, like the challenge. Um, because I remember last time, I was over at, uh, you know, the Bassmasters tournament over at Metro. This is like one pro said is like it really has changed the sport and suggesting that like you have to have it if you're going to come in like the top 10 or top 15 in the tournament now. And that's what he said. So, so you know, paraphrasing, I can't remember it was top something, but um, it really is. And But I was reading the comments down below the advertisement on Facebook and there was literally some fishermen like, I don't want to turn this into like a video game. Why would I want to do that? Um, it kind of losing, loses that reality feel of the challenge of going out and trying to, you know, catch fish. And it just, it's a big mystery what you might have at the end of your line. Um, you know, some days I thought I had a muskie on. It ended up being in like a five pound smallmouth bass. And sometimes it's fun just to have that mystery. And there's other things, like, again, the challenge. But then again, it's like this year in general, musky fishing, especially casting from, has been kind of, not kind of, really tough. As, as at, at, for me, at least, you know, I think, you know, I think some people, oh, I'm still getting them. Yeah, you're fucking trolling from, buddy. But anyways, for me, casting from, it's been kind of tough. Um, but something like this... I still might consider. I don't tournament fish, so I'm not really worried about, you know, taking, you know, having fair ground there, you know, have a fair leveling playing field. But, 
you're like this, where it's like you're tough catching musky using something like the Panoptix Live Scope, would it help me just give me a little more edge to targeting them, you know, finding the bay fish, finding the structure, whatever it may be. You know, I might consider that down the road, having a little extra money in my bank, buying something like this. And the technology is only going to get cheaper. So, and also the underwater drone technology, how that's going to come in, how that's going to play a role. Um, I think eventually that might also be used by fishermen down the road. Um, but it's just real interesting to think about these things. Um, but I just want to mention to you guys, though, those, the CBD oil, Z coals, because like I said, everyone always talks about like using your equipment, you know, using maybe even, like I said, using a lighter layer or just you get in your fifties, sixties, seventies, it's like, fuck it. I'm just going to troll from learn to adapt in life, man. Try to, it, you know, if you're out of shape, fucking start lifting weights and working out a little bit, you know? Get on an elliptical instead of running to increase your cardio. There's all types of different technology in other fields where you can increase your stamina and, um, you know, basically help you become a better musky fisherman because it's just, if you're out there casting from and you're not letting the boat do all the work, um, you love feeling the bite, you love seeing those follow-ups, you like the adrenaline rush, you like the more... Um, it's, you know, without a doubt, they're more likely to jump if you're casting for them and trolling for them. And I just, after I caught, when I caught the first few of them casting, I was like, dude, I mean, it like made me really look at trolling a lot differently. Now, when I first started YouTube, I showed like I did troll a lot at times to find where the smallmouth were. It's a great tactic to find out where fish are, you know, whether for any species of fish, musky or smallmouth, but I did a lot because I was more of a smallmouth fisherman back in the day. Find a spot, anchor, or just try to stay in the vicinity by looking at landmarks. And it just, trolling was a great way, but it's just like, as I gotten older, I just, I love the challenge. And even though, you know, I haven't done really well musky fishing this year, I still really haven't resulted to trolling. It just, I like getting out, I like to exercise. You're really burning off a lot of carbs and uh, calories when you're casting for them, and it just it 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 is it just so much fun to me. Even when I just you know I'll be casting all day and just get one follow up. At least the one I've seen, you just don't know how many times you get a muskie following up. Oh, that's another thing. Talk about that follow up I just had. If you notice, um, so. I casted out that KS Poseidon. I highly recommend picking up some of the Sportsman's Direct. Um, after it hit the water, I would say like five seconds later, I felt like, you know, you can feel a paddle and the vibration moving, but it felt like it just had kind of, it kind of had stopped just like in the middle, like a little mediocre. It lost that paddle tail. Um, it lost that paddle tail action and I still felt the vibration, but not as much. And I almost think, here's, you know, mimicking the Poseidon. I almost think these musky are evolving. They're getting up alongside, you know, this paddle tail swim bait, kind of feeling it against your body or their mouth or whatever, and then just backing off. And afterwards, he just came up and followed up. That musky was very aggressive. It seemed like if it was a bulldog, I probably would have got him the bite, you know, ripping it. But with swim baits, I mean, you can kind of still rep them, but they're not known for doing it. You just basically, it's a straight retrieve and let the paddle tail do all the work. But I swear to God, I've seen muskie also um, come up to my custom musker spinner bait numerous times. And they're feeling the tail just at the tip of it and letting go. And I swear to God, I didn't feel anything, but I saw it. And I saw it, oh, I want to say like four or five times. And it's like, <clears throat> damn, are these things evolving? Are they becoming smarter? I like to believe that for animals, uh, the bigger the animal is, the smarter they are. Um, we, I think most people, dog owners, they've noticed that with some dogs, um, or I mean a lot of dog species, I think musky can be the same way. I think as they age and they become bigger, stronger, more wiser, and they've been caught numerous times, it just, they're adapting and it's just like, 
you know, I highly recommend using fluorocarbon and whatever you can do to disguise your lure so they don't think it's like artificial right off the bat. But sometimes if they're not hungry and they're just looking to check something out, again, I think that Muskie did get up alongside my cast beside and kind of just stopped that paddle tail from wagging. And I lost that vibration. I'm like, what the fuck? I kind of pulled to the side and then I get closer. I'm like, I'm my mind telling myself, I think I'm going to, you know, expect to get a follow up. And what do you know I did? So it just, there's certain things. It might just be a slightly nip, a uh, slight bump, or even just you lose that vibration. Oh, there he goes. Um, they're, they're there, man. Whether they're feeling them out or whatever. I mean, these musky are just not as dumb as people like to believe. Um, I think it's a common known thing by the locals you go over canadian side less bow traffic more musky i don't think it's just that a lot of people also like to say because they're you know they're they're rivers um they take care of their natural resources a lot better than we do can considering what you know a lot of the spills that go on in the clinton river and spillway i don't think it's just that i think that's a factor but I think it's just a lot less boat traffic over there. You know, they got that Indian reserve over there. Um, it's just a lot less boat traffic. It always tends to be calm over there. But I think the, the muskie are sensing a lot of boat tra traffic up above. It hints to them, well, there's humans or whatever predators out for me in the area. And them being the apex predator, a lot of times I don't think they become intimidated. But then again, like I said... If they've been caught numerous times over and over again, they don't like that. They're not going to want to get caught again. Hence why they're, you know, they're kind of going up to your lures and just not mouthing it, nipping at it or whatever. And I think, of course, again, back to the bulldog, one of the best ways to prevent that is having a reaction style bait so they can get that, you know, bring out those characteristics of the T-Rex. You know, they talked about Jurassic Park and that thing's falling around stay still and it's not going to bother you but when you start running away that apex predator is going to follow you you know that's kind of like with muskie it just they when you pull out bring out all their full senses of getting that reaction style bait of jerking you know whether it's i mean a, a ripping a, a bulldog or jerking a jerk bait or slash bait or twitching a glide bait well it just it's bringing out you know their characteristics of what they like to do which is hunting and being that apex predator kind of like the t-rex so it's just yeah i mean it just you start to learn a lot of things and that's why you think a lot of musky fishermen some fishermen they'll just throw a big rubber all year round with those bulldogs and all they do is change up colors maybe add more weight to it change up tails i've seen fishermen cut off the tail change it with a different colored tail i guess that's what jason quintano did with his record musky lake st Clair with his pounder bulldog changed up his color of tail it's really easy to do you can use a lighter or use uh uh some of that um uh that glue i use um i really like that then you don't gotta play around with too much of the lighter crap lighting yourself on fire 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 um but Ah, <sighs> fishing glue. I forgot what that stuff's called. Menda glue. So, you know, that stuff even works great for musky baits. Um, I did want to say... <clears throat> what's his name? Doug Wagner had um, posted all the types of different swim baits. Um, hey talked about this before i think all the types of different swim baits for musky but the one thing they haven't done like you know what the suicide shed spin blade is is like they could cut this tail off basically right here and add this like giant willow blade back here and that's basically what it would look like you know and so you have a bladed swim bait i'm big into you know making hybrid baits um, whether it's using hard plastic material and soft plastic material, I think it really adds a lot, even if it's just the headbanger. I've done really well with pipe with the headbanger. They love this thing. Um, I prefer, this is the paddle tail version, but I prefer the, like the twister tail. Um, so, but I, I'm a big believer in that. I really like having a mix up 
that's I mean kind of I mean that's basically what this my custom musky spinner bait is you got soft plastic hard material I want the blade instead of just having a bucktail spinner which is just tinsel and blade you're having soft plastic blade and you can actually if you want add tinsel or bucktail into the spinner bait which I haven't done yet um, but I'm big into that having all types of different features on bait rather than just keeping it simple going back to those chatter baits by TNA Tackle the Angry Dragon, that's what they're doing. And I notice on some chatter baits overseas, they're even adding in like little spinners, little Col Colorado blades, adding more flash, more thump. They're just, there's really so much, <laughs> so many lures and so many ideas that there's, that musky fishermen haven't even done yet. I think I saw on someone's uh, Facebook page, page they added in a small Medusa to one of the Angry Dragon chatterbaits. I mean, I have to look over that again. But I'm like, how the fuck did they do that? But that added an, I guess, tremendous amount of action and different look to it. And this was a young kid that did it, and he's like, I swear by it, man, it works. I used to be more innovative when I was younger, you know thinking of all types of ideas you know when you get older you just don't have as much time as much time to think about it. you're more thinking about just wanting to get the fuck out and musky fish on the weekend being a weekend warrior just getting out there and fishing rather than just like oh what lure can i think of next because it just that's time consuming trying to figure out uh think up a fishing lure and i mean again there's a few lures that i want to design I bought some material for making a chatterbait, making a blade swim bait. Um, I made my custom musky spinnerbait, and I was thinking about selling that, but I was like, dude, I ain't got time to fucking pour lead, pour soft plastic material for the twister tail grubs, which this one I bought at Bass Pro. It's like seven inches long. Where did it go? You know, it just... I ain't got time to mess around with that, man. And if I do, it'll probably just be for myself. I mean, maybe one day I'll start think that, thinking of, like, selling them here and there. But it just, I know, guys, whether it's whatever car hobby, fishing hobby, that, you know, they became a mechanic. They became a lure maker. And I don't want to say they're still interested in the hobbies, but you do lose a little jazz. You lo lose a little thrill to it because you're doing it all day long. But then it's like you end up doing that all the time. I mean, I know guys that become, because they became a mechanic, instead of like being out cruising Woodward, drag racing at Milan Drag Strip, which I might have had, they found a new owner for that. I thought I was going to go bankrupt and it was just going to get gobbled up and the property probably get sold off for regular regular residential zone that's awesome that that drag strips going to be protected but anyways that they don't have time to do those things and they're just instead of like making let's make some more money on the side being a mechanic on the weekend i just i don't want to get to that point um i already youtube some of my you know other websites take up enough time so i just you know, some days I want to get back to making up some, developing some, like, musky t-shirts and bass t-shirts. It's just, you know, everyone's got interest in hobbies, and there's all types of ways you can make money from it. But it's just, like, how much time do you want to waste on that shit rather than trying to get, you know, like, a new record musky out on Lake St. Clair or record smallmouth or whatever, you're, you know. Sometimes I figure out, it's like, I want to get out there and do it rather than bullshitting about it. Don't get me wrong, it is fun. It is awesome. When I first made develop that spinnerbait, um, what's unique about it, I've talked about this many times, um, you can change the weight on it. Since it has a um, snap like it, like a beetle spin, it's very interchangeable. I can ch change the, the jig head on it, go from one ounce, two ounce, three ounce, four ounce, so it makes it adaptable, adaptable to the different depths of the water. And I was constantly like, I can't find a deep enough spinnerbait to target these bigger musky in deeper water. And so I decided to make my own. Um, I have a four ounce jig head in for this and I can toss in deeper water. 
Um, and then, you know, I wanted like to use a bigger willow blade. I wanted to use a grub. Most spinner baits, they usually tend to use bucktail or tinsel. I'm like, that's just boring to me. So it's fun when I developed, it was just amazing. And then I, I saw my first, I want to say it had to have been close to 50 inches or 45 inches near Shores Park. He came up again, kind of mouthed it. He kind of hit it though. Um, he didn't like. He really did, but like since these aren't treble hooks, it just everything went through his mouth. I'm like, God damn, I think it was like the biggest muskie I ever seen in person come up to strike my lure, and it was my custom muskie spinner. I'm like, man, if I caught that on it, it was a thick muskie. I mean, he was at least, I want to say, 45 inches or bigger, could have been a 50. And um, it slipped right through his mouth. And I'm thinking, like, you know, John Bonnie on his St. Clair grub, he decided to use treble hooks. I'm like, if I had used a treble hook, only, if only I would used a trailer hook, or a treble hook as a trailer, it would have, those other two hooks would have at least grabbed him on the angle he came at, you know, like I said. So it just, and then there's all types of things to think about. Again, making lures like this. Single hook, treble hook, double treble hooks. Pick up more weeds with double treble hooks. But then, you know, as this goes through weeds a lot better, where it was weedy that day, there was weeds on top, and that allowed me to cast in between those weeds and allow the spitter to still spill, still work through the weeds and on top and under. Um, even though, I mean, having the two single hooks was better for that, it just managed to still, still fucking slip through his mouth, man. I'll never forget that. It's just so much fun casting from. And again, I don't know how guys. I talked to one dude on YouTube. He's got a cool YouTube channel, one of the newer Lake St. Clair YouTube channels. I'm like, dude, you guys. What? I was fucking with him. Like, <laughs> I said, trolling's for pussies, man. But I'm just like, no, nah, dude, I'm just fucking with you. Um, but I just like, and he did, you know, he's like, dude, there's a lot to casting. You get a lot of. A lot of inflammation, a lot of pain afterwards the next day. Some guys, if they're fucking doing skilled labor, they're out doing construction on the road. last thing they need is to deal with that shit on the job. And they're just feeling like shit all through the day. So that's why I suspect my brother, he always liked trolling. He was an electrician. Put a lot more of his energy into that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Trolling, it's still... Setting up the rigs, you get weeds on them, you got to take the weeds off. It can be working, but it's not as much work as casting. Nowhere near it. So, I mean, just, you know, <laughs> it is what it is, man. Everyone has their own favorite way of fishing. It's funny that we kind of knock one another, occasionally joke around about it. Um, but personally, like, you know, I caught, of course, my biggest musky. I think it was around 47 inches trolling but i deep down i just like it's trolling it's like using live bait do i count that like would i only use that in a tournament no just like using live bait i won't be able to use a tournament so i to me that's how i my mindset i don't like i like to challenge too but i just i just you know if i caught a fucking seven pound smallmouth i'm trolling you know just like you know doesn't mean shit to me sometimes it's just i don't know that that's how my mind thinks. Everyone looks at things differently, um, but I just I never got into. I did get into trolling, but I just I just never got into like the other means of fishing. And there's nothing wrong if you like to do that. The problem I think you see the trolls on YouTube. It's it's cool if you're friendly about it. You're fucking with people and you point it out. But like some people would really go out of the way. Especially musky fishing. You use the right gear, bay casters, and not spinning reels. The perfect net, or not the net, at, or, you know, you, you shouldn't be fishing from at all. I mean, there's fishermen, locals out there. You, you shouldn't be musky f fishing from a kayak at all because you can put their health at risk. Look, I mean, just, I know trolling guys that troll out there, they put the musky at risk every day, every, every time they release them because. Yeah, they do have a aerated tank, but when they release them, they're not stopping the boat and see if they're revived so they can move you. them around. Some of them, they just release them. No, but you're trying to bring it back to life. Yeah. There's time, it's a, waste of a, hell of a few fish. times where it just...
you know, you know just didn't when I the time cast it for him, kept a little too long around the water. Yeah, no. I sat there, I want to say, for a good 25, just is not 20 to 25 minutes. And if I hadn't done that with them, they never would have been revived. So it just, I mean, to me, it just, I think, you know, it is what it is. Everyone, ha again, up here, everyone has their own set of rules own set of viewpoints this goes back to the whole thing some people should think there shouldn't be any type of youtube fishing and all some people think well pan optics that live scope internet technology should be a la but we live in a free country we live a lot of people believe in the capitalistic idea ideology of iron Rand that we should have a free market um i'm still like i think there should be regulation and things like healthcare. There's, you know if you listen to some of rogan saying how it's like a lot of things have been manip the science has been manipulated, lobbied by big pharma and shit like that. There's still, you know, things where you shouldn't like you gotta have some regulation, but it's just you know, considering what happened to opioid I'm an advocate and sharing that how the sugar industry put the blame on uh, fat instead of carbohydrates and sugar paid off scientists to manipulate the studies. Rogan always bring that, brings that stuff up too. So it's just, I don't know. You know, I'm in the middle there. I think I consider everyone's viewpoint, but it just uh, amazes me how just some people are just so ego, uh, got fucking egos online and they trash one another hard, man. You know. <laughs> Uh, it, it is funny, man. I mean, I've dealt with it throughout my channels too, man. Whether it's talking about climate change, I recently did had this one guy. It's hilarious. He's like, I talked to Northern Mike about this. How like he was trashing me for just saying like you should dunk your uh, reel, your saltwater reel, in a bucket for five minutes. I learned from that from Northern Mike, and he's like, you're gonna ruin the reel that way. I'm like, dude, you don't know want salt. Uh, you know, salt water getting exposed in the surf just as is from the splashes and occasionally dipping it in and out. I'm like, you think dipping it in a bucket of water for... It's like, you shouldn't be telling any type of tips at all. And then he's like, you said that was a closed off to actual salt water. It's not closed off. I'm like, all right, man. All right, calm down. And then he's... Afterwards, they have a long discussion. Your All your videos are shit, man. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's why i got a few sponsors i got complimented on by kim stricker but all that put aside i'm like yeah okay okay buddy just you know and it's just like this is a guy who's i guess worked in um he's claims real industry for 10 years and it's like dude and he keeps watching my videos i'm like if you fucking hate my shit stop watching it if it's driving you that nuts, man, it's just like, you really do get these people out there. just like, it's their way or a highway. And I've fished with some people like that. And I think most people know me by now. I'm not putting on a persona on the way I fish on YouTube or whatever. I'm a pretty laid back guy. If I wanted to compete in a tournament, I'd go fucking do it. Or I, you know, and I'm not claiming to be any pro. I make a mistake, whatever I say. So saltwater reel accidentally saying it's closed off and it's not with that Daiwa BG four thousand. Okay, I was wrong. No big fucking deal, man. You think I'm gonna start deleting videos because of what you said? It's just like it's it. Oh fuck, man. Some people's temperament in every hobby, whether it's I've seen an ice hockey, football, all the way to fishing, hunting. Cars, especially cars. Oh my God, talk about fucking egos. I mean, I've heard stories of people out there after they raced, well, you left the line too soon and they break out a gun. I mean, it's just like, I mean, this was this happened, I want to say 15 years or so out on Woodward. I'm like, well, probably why I don't race for money. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, when I've been down, I think it was at Joy Road and Plymouth Road, and same thing happened down there in Detroit, people drag racing. And it's cool, people take it that seriously. But I've seen friendships ruined over tournament fishing because, oh, you won a tournament, this fisherman didn't give half the assets to other fishermen, and this and that. It just, even when I'm not doing that, I'm just doing the YouTube thing. People say I'm trying to, like, ruin spots, bring pressure, and it's just, 
I understand it from a viewpoint on smaller water in the lakes, but it's starting to go on on big water too, and that's where it's like a draw line. I'm like, dude, this is Lake St. Clair. I was just out here last weekend. I think I saw maybe two boats trying to target musk on the weekend. It's a fucking ghost town out there, and a lot of fishermen, if they're musky fishermen, they're on the Canadian side anyways, and it's like, dude, there is enough room to go out there, and just the, the egos, man, it's hilarious. And what's that is just the kids are, their kids are probably, I know a lot of people with kids, they're just sitting at home, playing with their electronics, it's like, dude, it amazes me people get so worked up over bullshit, and it's like, they should be concerned about a lot of other things amongst, you know, the PFAS problem at Milford, uh, Lakes, uh, uh, Kent Lake, you know, Kent, of course, climate change, uh, uh, the other things like Agent Carp getting in here, but they just scapegoat, put all their focus on like, whether it's YouTubers, you know, f boiling, <laughs> Or pissing them off with bringing heat to a spot or a pressure spot. Ah, oh, amazing. I mean, it's just something really gets people's blood boiling. I mean, it's like, fuck, man. It's just like, dude, go fucking have a Snickers. Go fucking take some CBO. To go do something. Because, you know, I get tired of hearing about this shit. And it would be cool, man. It would be cool to... You know, you get older, you retired, you, get, you know, why I get this common is like people become less of a pupil person going back to this Air Force veteran that, you know, you worked for the, I think, uh, Air, you know, Air Force for how many years and he was living off the land. Let's see if we can bring him up here. You can't even do that anymore. Like, I gotta bring up this. So where is this dude? I think I post on my community page. I'll bring that up again. It's a weird, especially nowadays, a weird world we live in where it's like, you can't even live off the land. Oh, here he is. I think it was the Air Force Dave or whatever. Yeah, River Dave. So this dude, at one point, he built this, like, house, um... In a rural area, I guess years ago or decades ago, he was promised he could live off the land who, who by the original owner, but then I think a new owner came, you know, and then, you know, eventually came to the point he wanted him off his land. But it's, it's just weird how people like just trash one another. And this is a guy that just basically, I think when you, what I'm getting at is you get to a certain age, you get tired of dealing with people. It would be cool to just kind of just like, create your own pond, live off the land, do your own thing. And I'm sure, again, even through technology, people would try to find a way to fuck with you. Um, but it's just kind of cool. Cool story about River Dave. You can look up some of his videos on YouTube. See, you, you don't get lonely. I do not get lonely. I got chickens and a cat. <laughs> and if people ever ask you, why are you living out here? Why do you do it? You get away from people like you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Dave. Fair, Fair enough. enough. <laughs> you asked. But a lot of people are just, of course, a common capitalistic thing. Get a job, man. Dude, he worked for fucking Air Force for how many years? You know, if he wants to do what he's doing, you know, you may become, you might get to that point too. So, I mean, just these youngsters and other people, the trolls, fucking hatred online. It's insane. But kind of a cool story anyways where are dude I'll probably be getting out fishing again weekend comes around common thing my dad would always bitch about it's either raining or it's north northeast wind or uh, it's too sunny out uh, what else? Of course, you know, being too rough, it just is always something. But the problem is, is some type of truth to that because you only get two days 
a weekend for every job, you know, it narrows, narrows it down. That's why I was like, man, I was going to try to get out yesterday, but I was like, I didn't look at the weather, but I'm like, man, it, it should be good for the next two, year, two days. Now I'm just down to one day. Ah, oh, it sucks. What are you going to do? I only got, I think, uh, a few more weeks to keep my boat out of the water. But then, good thing about a kayak, break that bitch out, go over to, you know, one of the calmer spots and try to cast for some big smallies or musky. But I'm just, you know, got a lot of invites last uh, month or so. I just, dude, I've been catching smallmouth, like, since I was five. Lived in St. Clair Shores, Grosse Point region all my life. It just, I don't want to say the thrill is gone. I still have a blast, especially getting out with people, but... It's just, it's, you know, when you do it for how long, it's just, you know, it just becomes a common thing. Like, the greatest thing I like about musky is just the, all the different sizes. And then you can catch a pike, you can catch a tiger musky. It just, a lot of, a lot of all types of different complex differences in this, this Esox species rather than just... Catching a bass. Okay, I got another bass. This one, I just, a lot of times, they almost like, especially in the four or five pound range, it's cool to get one that looks plumper than the others, but it just, a lot of times, it's just so repetitive. I'm like, not knocking some of the guys that do it on YouTube, but I don't know how they can special their channel just to one species. I'm like, my mind would be, I'd be going on my wine, but I mean, props to... Like, Nowak, Benjamin Nowak, I think he's got a great channel. I just, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how air casting does it. Air casting is just like, I noticed he is starting to like, he, he, I know he likes catching musky. Um, I don't think he likes like the crazy challenge, you know, of, of getting one, especially if you're tarring him, tarring him. I mean, he ties into one every so often in the spring, and I know he loves it. I think he does like catching some of those pike at Kent, but we all know catching hammer handles over and over again is just, like, insane, too. But um, I just, yeah, I, I mean, some guys are like, oh, we're me and Norton Mike, and I think Alex, what would be the, f Alex always brings up, what would be your favorite species to catch over and over again? If you're on an island, and you'd have to catch one species. Um, well, Alex, first of all, why are you torturing us like this? And second, I mean, it you know, for me, it would be musky. But for those guys, uh, Alex and Mike love their smallies. There's nothing wrong with that because there at one point I was like that. Um, like kind of right before I kind of got into musky. But then it's again, I have carp fished. I have catfished. Um, then I went down finally saltwater fish to surf and I want to say I did give it a lot of um effort to really target all types of different species all types of lures really going after them snook real hard giving a good eight hours a day getting out there every fucking day of the week and having a blast and I tell you what I was telling my buddy the other Mike um who I fished with met down there and he's a big bass fisherman um lives in Connecticut, uh, that basically, I mean, snook is basically right there with musky now. And it's like, fuck, man. They both have similar traits, similar different characteristics. The, like I said, that one giant snook followed up my flare hot jig. It's like I didn't give him enough re reaction style to get him to bite. He never bit. But then I, you know, started throwing a jerk bait and then I started catching him. But that was a lot bigger snook than some of the ones I caught on that Glasgow's extra, but they, those snook are right there and I still haven't hooked, caught a tarpon and I'm like, that might overtake both those two. It's just like tarpon are, are insane. Talk about a fish on steroids. And if we had alligator gar up here, I would love to try to target that. That looks like a ton of fun too, man. Just the challenge of not getting scraped or bit by one of those fuckers with those giant teeth and long nose i'm like that's scary as hell i would like the challenge of trying to land one of those looks like a lot of fun they they get pretty gigantic um but it's just i think you should keep an open mind to always trying different um sports different type of species of fish to target 
I've done the carp thing and that's considered a garbage fish over here in the States, but over in Europe, they really cherish those fish. They actually go out of their way after they hook into one, land one. They put like this, um, like some type of supplement material on their wound where they hook them to try to heal it. I mean, they really cherish their carp over there and talk about Russia. I've heard that they don't have a lot of whole different species of fish and they love their pike. That is told, that's so typical of Russians that they would love northern pike. They really want, <laughs> since they're a really hard looking fish, like they're fucking hard to kill. I mean, they fucking <laughs> probably take over the world if they, I mean, like, that's what I said. I mean, me and Mike talk all the time how the pike have kind of, they really have populated uh, Kent Lake and it's like, DNR should probably do something about it, but anyways, little Gucci, little musky bait back there barking up. So, um, anyways, had a fun shooting the shit with you guys in this podcast. Um, again, I'll probably be getting out tomorrow musky fishing. Think about since I found out that musky had to fall up that swim bait, I think I'm just gonna basically center on throwing that like all day long. I mean, it's tough with the spinning. That's why I eventually want to merge over to Bay Caster, throw in Bay Grubber, but I could do it um, and go from there. So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Over and out.